All right, this is Josh Olson from Battlefront Apologetics Christian Defense Ministries. And uh, this is a debate between myself and uh, Benjamin Duncan. Um, Benjamin, you're an atheist? Yes, sir. Okay. You tell me what um, led you to the atheistic position, what, what put you there? Well, both my grandparents were Baptist ministers, and I went to a Christian school until ninth grade. Um, it was a very restrictive Christian environment. I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody who wasn't a, a Christian. Um, uh, I love my rusty Chatfield. It's here in, uh, in Northern Michigan, the Northern Michigan uh, Christian Academy. And I was there for about uh, up until the ninth grade, as I said. And um, I, I'd say that I, I was never a fundamentalist, even as a kid. Um, but I had no exposure to anything other than the Christian worldview. And I would say what really deconverted me was um, getting to know secularists when I got to college and stuff like that. And just uh, coming to realize that the uh, power of the Holy Spirit or uh, being saved didn't seem to make much of a difference in um, the quality of, of a person. It wasn't a, a, a sudden process, it was uh, due to a series of uh, small changes in the way I viewed things over a long period of time. Okay, could you give me a definition of atheism? Of an atheist? It, yeah, what, what's your definition? Look, you look up the definition of a theist and you say what a person who is not that is an atheist. Uh, a theist is somebody who believes that there's a God that he is involved in the uh, world, he's involved in the events in the world, and that his um, will can be somewhat understood by people. That's a theist. If you are not that, if any part of that doesn't apply to you, then you're an atheist. Okay, well, as, uh, as you already know, I'm a, I hold the Christian position. I've been doing apologetics for about nine years. And for the, about the first four and a half, five years, somewhere around there, I've been, I discovered I was doing apologetics wrong. I was arguing evidentially. So this will, you know, I won't be focusing on any specific evidences in our discussion. I, I argue presuppositionally, and that's where I get to the core of, uh, of your worldview. You know, what, could it provide uh, intelligibility of human experience? Can it make sense of, you know, more specifically, can it make sense of morals, um, rationality? Right, but you're not science. arguing presuppositionally. Let me a second. You're not arguing presuppositionally for theism. You're arguing presuppositionally for Christianity, right? Yes, yeah, specifically Christianity. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my position is basically that. You know, knowledge to, to, to be able to know anything at all, you, you got to start with God. God is a necessary precondition for for knowledge to be possible, for morality to be possible, uh, for science to be possible. Um, and that, that's the position that I hold to. Um, the, my position is not that you need to prof profess belief in God, that you need to acknowledge that God exists, um, only that he needs to exist. And it's like uh, you might have heard this little analogy about somebody who would debate against the existence of air, you know, arguing that, that they don't even believe in air, all the while they're, they're breathing air while they're making their arguments. So my argument would be that the, the atheist actually needs to borrow from Christian presuppositions, borrow from the Christian worldview to make any arguments at all. Okay. Um, what is an example of that? Well, we're doing it right now. I mean, during a discussion or debate or anything like that, you already take for granted that you expect that the discussion would be rational, um, that, that there would be rational reasoning in the discussion, um, which and all that would be contingent upon an adherence to the laws of logic. Um, Does the Bible present arguments for the existence of God? No, the Bible assumes that God already exists. Right. My it position is more specifically, and my position is Romans one eighteen to twenty one. You know, you already know 
that God exists. Everybody already knows in their heart of hearts. I God don't exists. see that's um, of everything. Like I don't even care if people um, believe in God or not. That's the one myth I don't like. Is the assumption that everybody knows. Um, well, I'm just. Like, it doesn't even matter from, to me. If, right. I, I'm just arguing from from my worldview. You know, I'm standing on. My ultimate standard for my worldview is the Bible, and I stand on that when, you know, when I argue for it. Um, so I'm just telling you what the Bible says, that everybody already knows in the heart of hearts that God exists, that he's revealed himself uh, in such a way that people can know him for certain. And, uh, you know, being made in his image, that we would, we would be aware of... Uh, Morality, we, we would. Right. But doesn't the Bible also say you should not lean on your own understanding? Exactly. Yes, it does. So that isn't a, isn't that an argument against uh, reason? No, not specifically, because God is the the source of, of reason, rationality. I mean, the laws of logic are a reflection of the way He thinks. So, and we're obligated, even morally, to think logically, to be rational. Um, but that's your own understanding. If, you, if you're using your head, then you're using your own understanding. Or using it in accordance to what God expects, you know, what we're obligated to do. Um, being made in his image, you know, that's, that's the way we are supposed to operate. I mean, if you're, if you're not being rational in discussion or debate or anything like that, um, <clears throat> you're, not, you're not thinking God's thoughts after him, basically. Um, and uh, I asked this question earlier um, in, a, in another phone conversation. You know, is it possible for the eternal, all-knowing God to reveal some things to us in such a way that we can be certain of them? That we can be certain? Yeah, that we can be certain of them. You know, can you reveal some things to us in such a way that we can know them for certain? Sure, if, it's, if, if he exists... If it exists, that would be yeah. possible, sure. Okay. To acknowledge the fact that there's a possibility for knowledge in no. light of what I, 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 I acknowledge that he could reveal himself if he existed, or could reveal knowledge to us if he existed. Okay. Well, that's, that's the position that I hold to, is that, that he can do that, he can and has done that. And, uh, okay. What is, what is an example where he has done that? Well, everybody, no matter who you are, um, strives to think logically. We're, we're all aware of the laws of logic. The laws of logic are immaterial, they're universal, and they don't change. Um, man does not create the laws of logic. Um, to deny the laws of logic, any of those attributes that I just listed, removes from them their prescriptive power, thus negating the possibility of rational discourse on any level. Okay. Well, the laws of logic have been uh, further understood um, over time and have been evaluated and changed somewhat. Well, I'm sure our understanding of them have, have changed. Um, our knowledge of them may have gotten better mm -hmm. or more complete, but that doesn't mean that we've created logic or that we invented logic or anything of like that that sort. You know, it's like we didn't create the sun, um, but through scientific science and all that stuff, we've, we managed to figure out more about the sun and how it works. You know, so it's not like the sun okay. didn't exist until we came up with better understandings of it. And it's the same thing with the laws of logic. I mean, they're there, they exist. <clears throat> everybody's aware of them, everybody uses them. Um, I wouldn't say everybody's aware of them. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say everybody's, everybody's logical all the time. <laughs> but I mean, the, the bottom line is, is which worldview, whether it be the, uh, my worldview, the Christian worldview, or your worldview, the atheistic worldview, which one of those two can make sense of the laws of logic? Because if you're, if you presuppose the laws of logic, and your worldview cannot make sense of the laws of logic, you're being inconsistent. You're borrowing from something that your worldview cannot make sense of. Okay. 
Now, I still don't understand. I, I still don't understand even the basis of your argument. Um, why would that make it a, make there a god? I, just because there's a, there are laws of logic that can be understood, why does that make there? Why does that mean there's a spirit that made them? Well, it's, I'm not saying that God made the laws of logic. I'm saying they're a reflection of the way He thinks. So therefore, the laws of logic have always been. They've always been in existence. Okay, so because we were made in God's image, so because we're made in God's, God's image. image this ability to rationalize our existence is part of a, is an attribute he had that he gave to us when he made us. That's what you're saying. It's it's like uh, yeah, basically. I mean, it's, it's a reflection of the way he thinks, and we've had you know we're made in his image. We're, we're expected to think logically. We're expected to, to reason rationally, um, and. We know how he thinks because he's, we've had some of his thoughts revealed to us through the word. And I know you're not going to accept that being an unbeliever, but that's my position. That, uh, and it says not to lean on your own understanding. I still don't get how how leaning on your own understanding is not being logical. Saying, how is the Bible not says lean not on your own understanding. Right. Right? So it says, trust in the Lord always and lean not on your own understanding. So trust in the Lord always. So the way that verse is always read to me whenever it's brought up in church or anywhere else is that that means that we should just accept what the Bible says, accept the claims without trying to suppose whether they are true or not. Using logic is supposing whether they are true or not. Well, no, I mean, you would... Basically, how do I word this? Okay, so every ultimate standard for every worldview leads to consequences. Um, I don't know what the ultimate standard is for your worldview yet. We haven't covered that, but my position is that only the Bible leads to the consequence of the possibility of knowledge, because only the Christian worldview provides for the preconditions of intelligibility by which we know things. The Buddhism worldview doesn't? No other worldview, atheistic, whatever, no other worldview does this. Not, not consistent. Buddhism does, so, sure. Buddhism has the five precepts. Well, I'm not... Okay, you go ahead and tell me how, how Buddhism... I mean, are you a Buddhist? No. <laughs> okay. But I'm saying that a lot of beliefs have, have various um, moral precepts that are kind of universal. Like the ancient Egyptians, when they buried themselves, they would write like a transcription outside their tomb, which said, which was a comp, which was a message to the gods, um, telling them their kind of their case for going to, you know, the paradise, whatever they believed, and the the case usually involved, you know, the, the uh, I didn't lie, I didn't cheat, I didn't steal, I didn't kill. And that'd be over, you know, they'd basically say, like, I did not steal from my employer. I did not cheat on my spouse. I did not attack my friends or punch my parents. And the same thing goes with, with the Buddhists, the priests, with the precepts of Buddhism. The, they hold the same five. You know, I do not lie. I did not cheat. I did not steal. I did not kill. Um, I understand. The same thing goes with yeah. Christianity. Right. Yeah, in, I in the that. Ten Commandments, they have the same five. I did not lie, cheat, steal, or kill. So the, you're saying that it comes from the Bible, and it, it's come it's from crop cultures that never had any ex, any exposure to the Bible. Oh, it's not, it's not required. It isn't required because the Word of God has always been true. God has always existed even before the written word of the Bible that we have today. Um, you can't you can't come on your own to to realize that killing somebody's bad. I I don't I don't know. I think that's kind of a weird hypothetical because. My position is that everybody already knows that God exists, and therefore they will act morally. They will have an awareness of the universal moral code. That makes sense in light of my worldview, but in light of an atheistic position where we are nothing more but, you know, complex systems of chemical reactions. That doesn't make sense of universal moral code. Because let's say if I said, in this, you know, from our prior conversation, if I said it's okay that I was a murderer, I thought it was a good thing that I was killing people. And it was just something I enjoyed to do, without an absolute moral standard by which you make your appeal. 
um, how could you argue me argue me out of that position? Easily. Even if you were a sociopath or a serial killer, you would need to live in a moral world in order to, or to operate, or you would get killed too. Why is that? Why is it a bad thing to kill, and why is it a bad thing to be killed? Because well, even do you even say that. Well, do you even say that murder is wrong? What what kind of things are you assuming that people have an inherent value? Well, we have what are called mirror neurons. You, you ever, you've heard of a mirror neuron. There are parts of our brain that get triggered when we see certain emotional states from other people that this has been studied. You, know, you hooked up people to machines and they show them various pictures of people and, and they tell them to uh, mirror the facial expression of the person you're looking at. So they'll mirror, they'll mirror their, you know, they're, if they look sad, they'll mirror that. And if they look happy, they'll mirror that. And they show that, that while they do that, they say that they actually experience certain emotions while they were looking at the pictures. Well, then they did it with a control group, and they didn't tell them to mimic the expressions. They told them to just look at the pictures. And the same areas of the brains were stimulated. And these areas of the brains are called are what are what studied later to be mirror neurons. We have this in our brains. It's part of our neocortex. It's part of the brain that, um, in humans, allows us to feel other people's pain. Okay. And in some people, this doesn't work very well. You know, you have people that are born with a sociopathic tendency. They're, you know, it's probably because their mirror neurons don't work very well. My son, when I, when he was little, I was watching a movie, you know, Natural Born Killers, that movie. Yeah, are you familiar with that movie? Uh, I don't think I've ever seen that one. Okay, well, it's a movie about the, the, the two main characters, the protagonists, are horrible killers. They go around and they're massacring. Um, people and and it, and it portrays it in a glamorous light intentionally. Like there's like crowd applause when they whack people and stuff like that. And I asked my son, he was what three years old at the time. I said, "Are they the good guys?" He said, "No, they're the bad guys." So even if even though he was trying to be influenced to see them as kind of good guys, he was able to tell that you know he killed the person and that was a bad thing. And right. he never had any impact or any um, understanding of God or anything like that. Really? It's not required. That's, that's my position. Is he a profession? It's not required because of because we have mirror neurons. <laughs> well, right. That God designed and put there. See, it makes sense in like well, my worldview that there would be a universal moral code and people would would feel obligated to adhere. It doesn't make any sense in uh, using the Darwinian uh, hypothesis. No, not really, because you don't really know that killing is bad. You say, well, killing is bad because it's... Sure you could. You could say it has emotional effects. A, but how do you know that emotional effect? A tribe, a tribe of people that didn't know that killing was wrong wouldn't have succeeded. They would what? See, one thing that's true of human beings is that we, we tend to operate with an in-group and an out-group. We're cruel people. And at the same time, we can be very caring. But we're caring to our in-group. We're caring to our children. We're caring to the people that we see as our countrymen. And we can be very cruel to people that we see are different than us. And chimps even ex exhibit this. Chim chimps live in a little tribe, and they're very nice to the people in their tribe. But when they see another chimp from a different tribe, they're very mean to them. They can be, they're nasty, nasty animals to people who, to the, the chimps that are different than them. And, and we all exhibit this to a great extent. We're warlike, but at the same time, we're very kind to people who we think are like us. But this is this is exhibited in all primatology. It's not just humans. Right, and that, that you know, that still that makes sense. I'm not saying approve the. Critical. But it's it's helpful. It's helpful to our survival. So it it makes sense in a Dar Darwinian uh, framework. Right. Well, it'd be helpful to our survival whether you know, creation or evolution were true. So it, it really doesn't do any That's good true. discriminating between the two because it's beneficial in light of either position. I'll concede that that point, yes, that, that one aspect alone would make sense in either framework. Right. Um, but again, like, even deeper to the core things, and, and we, we can go back to the moral argument if you want to and talk about morality, is uh, the ability to reason. And I, I asked you this in our prior phone conversation, um, but 
I got to ask it again because now we're, you know, this thing's actually recording now. Is how do you know that your reasoning is valid? Because nothing suggests otherwise. You're talking about whether I, where I know I'm here and whether I know that my um, senses are telling me the truth, etc., etc. Sure. Because I have a suggestion that they're telling the truth because of, of the uh, the uh, triggers or the um, the impulses that are sent to my brain when I feel things, when I look at things, when I hear things. And there's nothing that, that there's nothing to the contrary that suggests that they aren't true. Okay. There has to be at least one thing to suggest they aren't true. For the question to, to for the question to be asked, is my um, is reality true? There there has to be something to suggest there isn't it isn't true for the question to be asked in the first place. Okay, so basically, you are reasoning that your reasoning is valid, correct? What's, what's the ultimate standard for? I'm just trying to get to the... I am, getting, I am getting information. I am getting information from my senses. Which you have to read. They tell me that they're valid. Right. you got a reason What's about that? those. You got you got a reason about that information. In order to reason... Does a baby have abstract reasoning? Does, I mean, does a baby interpret some kind of abstract reasoning about his reality? I don't know. I don't remember. I can't go that, that far back. <laughs> Well, he looks at, well, we've seen babies, and they seem to look at things, and he knows that, you know, he feels the bars on his crib, and after touching them for a while, he realizes that he can't kind of travel through them. So he's, he's, uh... Right, yeah, that makes sense. Right. So, and he knows the, right, that right. the milk tastes good, and then the milk is white, and if you hand him the bottle of yeah, soda pop, he, you know... That doesn't answer the question, though, because I'm, I'm asking about reasoning here. How do you know that your reasoning is valid? Because my senses give me information that tell me they're valid. Okay. And nothing suggests that my senses are untrue. Okay, but in order to... You would already have to presuppose... No, I don't. ...that are at least basically reliable. <laughs> no, I don't have to presuppose that. Nothing suggests the, the, the contrary is true. Okay, but... Let's say I don't have I a choice. As, as, I don't have a choice for my original supposition about my, whether my senses are true. I don't have a, a choice in the matter because nothing suggests the other, the the, the contrary. Mm -hmm. Let's say there there was an example one time about how you have like a, a bucket of water. Okay. And you put a, a board of wood in that water. Right. And you see how the wood looks like it bends. Right. Well, you know that the wood really isn't bending. Okay. Um, you already have that knowledge because you have a better standard. So you know that in that regard, you can't really trust your senses. Right. But somebody's told me they don't bend. Right. If I didn't know better and I just looked at it, I would think it was bending. Right. Um, yeah, so basically, my point is you still you already have to presuppose that your senses are at least basically reliable in order to to come to conclusions that there might be something about your senses that, that isn't reliable. Is that making any sense? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't consider it a, pre, a presupposition that my senses are reliable. We, we, we learn that the senses are reliable from being babies and feeling things and, and, and encountering the physical world around us. No one had to tell us. It's just something that we've that we learn from experience. Well, presupposition isn't necessarily something that somebody tells us. I mean, it's just a uh, you know something you believe beforehand. Um, but they don't have a presupposition. They learn it by just touching things and learning that they that they can't move through. Oh, right. That. I mean, right. A baby doesn't know what's real or what's not when it comes out. At least as far as we 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 can see. They wake up and they start, you know, touching things and moving things around. They don't know what, you know, if they can move through the wall or they can move through the cage bars. They don't know. And they learn over time that it's not reliable. So this is a matter we solve when we're babies. I don't think it's a presupposition. It's a trial and error. It's a conclusion you reach by trial and error. If the whole world is just an illusion, 
nothing suggests that it is. So I should just... It's possible that it is, though. Well, possibility doesn't suggest anything's true. I mean, it's possible that all the planets are big, you know, lizard eggs, and that, you know, one day dragons are going to burst from them, and uh, that's possible, too. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't know otherwise, but nothing suggests that it's true. And if nothing suggests that that's true, why should I pursue it? Okay. Okay, so back to the original question. You stated that <clears throat> basically you could be wrong about everything you claim. Um, it's possible, but a possibility doesn't enter into reasoning. I only go, I, you go by what evidence tells you. And um, the evidence doesn't suggest anything other than the idea that my senses are valid and that reality or you know what I see and what I feel and what I can touch and what pe other people can see and feel and touch is the real world. Right. Nothing suggests otherwise. I understand that you take the atheistic position, but I got a hypothetical for you. Is it possible for the biblical God, the eternal uh, omniscient God, omniscient being all-knowing, is it possible for that God to reveal some things to us in such a way that we can know them for certain? That we, okay, finish the, the end of your sentence again. To reveal it in such a way that what? That we can know things for certain. No. That you can re, you can perceive that he reveals things in such a way that you can perceive that you re, that you know them for certain. Okay, so it's not possible for the all powerful. There's not su there's not possible that there's an all powerful. <laughs> So if God cannot exist, um, okay, we can't. We can't. Uh, obviously, I can't disprove the existence of God because um, it's a, the claim involves immaterial reality. Um, I didn't make it that way. That was the people that came up with it, invented a God that was um, impossible to see, impossible to uh, to detect in some kind of physical manner, and they made them that way so that people couldn't uh, prove he didn't exist. Um, so the real question of, of so the question to me isn't can I prove or disprove the existence of God? The question is 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 the immaterial nature of God um, a present and realistic characteristic of a real thing, or is the immaterial nature of God um, part of something that people made um, up as an attribute for God so that he couldn't be disproven? And what I know about human beings suggests that the latter is true. People are very imaginative. They, uh, we make up movies and books, and, and uh, we have a long history of being very imaginative. Well, my point is, is that all right, a worldview could be defined as a network of basic presuppositions by which all reality and observations are interpreted. So if you have these networks, this network of presuppositions, let's say uh, reliability of senses, that is one of preconditions of intelligibility is something that you have to assume in order to learn things or to know things. Um, all presuppositions, in order to be rational, must be cogently justified from within your worldview. And my question would be, how does that atheistic position of yours justify the reliability of senses, reliability of memory, laws of logic? Um, you want one justification? I can just give you one. What's that? Oh, you, yeah, just give me one. Sure. Um, well, uh, at the beginning of Christianity, uh, far before uh, you know Jesus died on the cross and Christianity began to spread, the um, human life span was about all oh, 33, 34 years old. And uh, right before the uh, Age of Enlightenment was about 33, 34 years old. And when science came around and uh, medical science came out around, it jumped up to about 70 in a matter of about 150 years. So relying on reality to be our guide and not relying on the spiritual world to be our guide um, made an impact. And relying on the spiritual world, relying on prayer, made no impact whatsoever. Over a period of, of uh, 1,500 years, people were praying to the right God, and it changed nothing. But science changed something. As far as uh, the betterment of people, the betterment of society, the uh, longer lifespans, etc.
Well, which part was that a justification for? Which, which uh, pre yeah, that's right. The presupposition that when we study the natural world, that the natural world can be true because the study of it um, has brought us advancements that have actually changed reality. Whereas the um, study of the of the spiritual world, as far as you know, prayer and meditation and internal uh, internal searches for uh, faith-based positions hasn't done that. People were praying to Jesus Christ for 1,700 years, uh, 15 to 1,700 years, and it made no change as far as the um, the lifespans and etc. You know that? Yeah, I do know that. <laughs> it's been studied. Standard for knowledge. What's your standard? For, well, you said that you could be wrong about everything you claim to know, which means you can't have knowledge. I could, but I, I, I just because I could doesn't mean it's possible. Okay, just because it's possible that I could doesn't mean that there's any reason to believe that that I couldn't. Well, no just because it's could, though, because but the but it's possible that the world's a lizard egg. Like I said, there, there's no more justification to say that there's a God than to say that the world is a big lizard egg and that a dragon will pop out of it someday. Well, no, you're here, you're there is like justification think... to say that my senses are true. At least I have something there. I don't have anything on the, on the other way. I don't have anything to say that they're not true. Just because they could be true doesn't mean that the, that the question, could they be false, is a question worthy of being asked. Here's the thing, though. It's like, if you already make the claim, or at least admit it to the fact that you could be wrong about everything you claim to know. You I could have knowledge about anything. Huh? I could be, but nothing suggests that I am. At least, at least as know? far as this discussion. But you could be wrong about that. I could be, <laughs> but nothing suggests oh, yeah. that I am. There has to be at least some evidence for the that. question. Look, there has to be at least some evidence for the question, is there a God to be worthy of being asked? And there's not enough evidence to even make that, that question worthy. Well, again, like I said earlier, evidence is always interpreted in light of what you already believe. There's not a neutral approach to evidence. Uh, the philosophy that evidence ought to be approached without a philosophy is in fact itself a philosophy, therefore it's self-refuting. Everybody has a worldview. Everybody has a lens by which they look through and interpret everything around them. I would say that the very concept of evidence itself is proof that God exists, because evidence itself presupposes truth, knowledge, and logic. Okay, That's give me an problem. example. Give me an example of how your worldview might lead you to, to look at evidence differently that I and will interpret it differently. An example of evidence that you would interpret differently. And it evidence that you would interpret differently, or you would interpret not as evidence because of your spiritual uh, worldview. Well, because of my Christian worldview, I would interpret the universe differently than, than an atheist would. I would interpret uh, basically everything. I mean, everything, a human experience, um, which, which entails everything. That you and I aren't going to agree on. on I don't know. If, I don't know. I think that is an exaggeration. I don't think it is everything. I think is I think that we have much more in common as as Americans than we do as uh, different, by our different religious views, making us different. I think we're much more in common. I don't think it's true that uh, we're yeah. really that different. What's that? Well, that's true, but that's, you know, because, all right, let me, let me try and get my, uh, correct. that's confirmatory of my worldview. I want to know how it's confirmatory of your worldview. Because we're just biological bags of stuff. Morality is the um, combination of empathy and reason, and we have we have what are called like you were just talking about the biochemical interactions in our brains, and that that creates empathy. And then we have reason, which comes from symbolic interaction. We codify the world around us, and we base this into we turn this into abstract concepts that allow us to break down uh, things into uh, you know uh, morals or. or uh, or concepts, you know, etc. And these have spread. And the the, uh, the symbolic interactive part of our brains is something that has been developing with civilizations over a long time. The other part is comes from the animalian part. But animals don't have morals. They they, they do have um, they have empathy. I mean, you know, it, there's been various experience with chimps that have shown that they have, uh, you know, 
exhibited empathy, but they don't really have morals in the sense that a chimp will look at another chimp, hurt some, hurt another chimp, and say, well, you know, you need to get out of here, and you know, that's not right. They don't do that. But what we're different than chimps is that we have reason. So, like, like for instance, the Bible says nothing about um, driving the speed limit, you know. It doesn't say that you can't drive 60 miles an hour on a 45. It doesn't say that. But it does say, but but we do defer, we, we create this moral system to say you can't drive 60 miles an hour by simply, um, by studying over time that, that speed um, is a factor in car accidents and our empathy for other people has caused us to create a moral code regarding traffic laws. Right, and but it all comes from our empathy. Yeah, but also in the biblical worldview, I mean, in the biblical worldview, we are to adhere to uh, authority. I mean, the, the people who are placed above us in positions of authority, and we are to listen to them. But do you agree with that? Tra do you agree with traffic laws? Well, yeah, I would agree with traffic laws. <laughs> and that, that's, that's coming from reasoning. That's not coming from anything biblical. No, I'd, I'd say that the ability to reason at all starts with God. It depends upon God. Okay. I just offered a, an explanation for where for where that for that that we have this. I mean, I don't disagree with you that we have an inborn um, ability to rationalize. I don't disagree that we have an inborn uh, ability to empathize, but I just don't think it comes from a supernatural origin. Right, yeah, just because we have yeah, just because I agree that it's inborn doesn't mean that it comes from a, that I'm agreeing that it comes from a supernatural origin. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand that. Um. Okay. Does absolute truth exist? Does absolute truth exist? Um, in what way? It depends on what 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 it, what the truth is about. Um, let's say is it uh, you know an absolute something being that's that's unchangeable something that. Uh, that it's not contingent upon opinion or preference. Sure. There are some things that are not contingent uh, upon yeah. opinion or preference, yeah. Right, okay. So where do you get truth from within your worldview? From my senses. <laughs> well, when you're talking about what, what doesn't rely on opinion or preference, then you're talking about concrete reality. So we're talking about something like, is there a rock in my yard? And I walk up there, I pick up the rock, I said the yeah. rock was in my yard. So that's a concrete truth. Okay, and if, I, if I were to ask you how you know it's real, you would my, just go back to your senses? I'd go back to my senses. Okay. So just how do you know you're, you're not living it's in not, it's, I realize that, that the fact that I have to rely on my senses to realize what's true and not is not an attractive notion. It isn't attractive to know that the um, that our realities are determined by nothing more than the way we feel and the way we interpret the sensory information. That's not attractive. It, you know, we'd like to know things for certain. That doesn't make it untrue because it's not attractive. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's, there's something wrong with having to with, with presuming the reliability of your senses. With you know utilizing your senses to know things or, you know, to gather information, whatever. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. You know, but the position that I that I hold to is that the reliability of senses, reliability of memory, laws of logic, uniformity of nature, or what else, you know, it's also called uh, induction. Um, you know, those things are presuppositions. They're also the preconditions of intelligibility. Um, and your worldview has to be able to make sense of those things in order for the worldview to be rational. Sure. I mean, the worldview has to be logically logically consistent within itself, and it also has to provide for the preconditions of intelligibility for how we know things. So, so <clears throat> you, know, you could ask me how does my worldview account for the law? reflection of the way God thinks, the laws of logic are immaterial, universal, and they're immutable. Um, God is also universal, immaterial, and he does not change. Um, okay, I don't think the belief the in God is... Okay, 
I don't know if the belief in God is coherent, but I, I, I don't, you know, you're asking me if it's coherent on that level. I, you know, it's it might be, I suppose, but I don't think it's coherent in a lot of other ways. Um, the the God is supposed to know everything. He's supposed to be able to do anything he can't. He he wants to do, right? He's supposed to be uh, uh, omniscient and omnipresent and uh, capable of anything, right? Well, I'm not anything like God can't lie. God can't make a rock so big he can't lift. You know, he, he can't do anything that's logically inconsistent, or he can't do anything that's inconsistent with his own nature. Right. But he can do any. But he could, like you know, basically. Right. But he could fix sin, right? He can what? He can fix sin. He can fix sin. Is that can he said? fix sin, or can he can he save people without killing his son? Um, no. So he can't. So he's no, not all-powerful. Well, he, ha he had to do it that one way. What's that? He could that, create that the whole the world. That... Okay, go ahead. Because it was consistent within his nature to do what he did. To, to send his son into the world to die and, you know, paying for the penalty for our sins and to rise again, defeating death. That was... That was the way he chose to do it because that was the way that was consistent within his nature to do it. It doesn't seem more consistent with a fantastic story. So what story? It doesn't seem more consistent with um, it being a fantastic story. Don't the nature of oh, most of the so. biblical it stories... Is a fantastic story, but... Don't most of the biblical no, stories a... have a nature of being entertaining in some level? Well, they're they're good stories. I mean, they're interesting, interesting stuff to read for sure. But uh, you know, you want to get into the, uh, you know, why did why did Christ die on the cross? You know, why did God, the Father, send him to die? And all that other stuff. Right, but I mean, but, that was just... but on one level, the Christian the Christian uh, the Christian worldview constantly says that God's all powerful, and on the other hand, they say He's limited in His power. He can't do this. He can't do that. So that's that's uh, incoherent. He can't fix sin, he can't end suffering, he can't find a, a reasonable way to decide who goes to heaven or hell. If he can't, he can't, he can't, he can't. And I would say that's an incoherent uh, aspect of, of theism. And on the other hand, they also say, will also constantly say that, um, okay, for instance, here's a, here's a parable. Let me give you a parable for where I, the way I view Christianity, why I don't think it's coherent. Okay, you got a man, and he builds this great, big, huge mansion. And after building the mansion, he decides, you know, you know, I spent my whole life building this thing, and but I don't want to live it by myself. I want other people to live with me. But the pr problem is, I took so long to build it that I didn't meet any people, and I really want to find some people to live with me. So he puts an ad in the newspaper. Um, the, you know, the mansion has 5,000 rooms. It's the most glorious mansion ever built. And he asks, you know, if anyone's interested in living in the mansion. He gets, you know, to a surprise, he gets about like 100,000 responses. And so he says, well, i got to figure out who's deserving to live in this mansion. So he comes up, so he says, well, I could interview everybody. But people aren't really themselves in an interview. You know, they're not, they're not their true, true selves. They, you know, they tend to put on a facade. So what he decides is he puts cameras in everybody's homes. He, and he tires the teams of researchers to watch these cameras 24-7 via full circuit video feeds. And after watching the, the cameras for a while, these researchers come up to him and they say, well, you know, here's a problem. It seems that some people are good sometimes and bad some other times. So you need to come up with a clear test to determine who's deserving and undeserving. So here's what he comes up with and tell me if this makes any sense. He puts little notes on their doors, and he puts little notes on their, their car windshields, and, it, and the notes say, I'm watching you by closed circuit video feeds. And if you believe I'm watching you, then you'll get to deserve to live in the mansion. Now, does that make any sense? The reason he hid the cameras in the first place is because he didn't want to influence their free will by having them know that he was watching them. So why would he make that the test? Hello. I'm not sure. <laughs> why? Why would the test be belief? Like, like on one well, hand, you, you, one hand, Christian, right? you'll, Christian, you'll say that that the reason 
we can't see God, the reason that God doesn't make himself apparent to us, the reason we point the Hubble telescope up at the at the deep field, we don't see God stand up there waving at us, is because God doesn't want to mistake himself too apparent to affect our free will. We need to have a choice. And if we were standing there hovering over us all the time like he did in the Garden of Eden, then we wouldn't be ourselves. I don't, I don't, I don't believe that we have total free will. Well, but God, God doesn't sit up there and hover over us and tell us what to do all the time, right? Do I ever look up at the sky and he stands there and says, you know, Benji, you need to believe in me. Does he ever do that? He doesn't do it because it would make... What's that? You're going to repeat that last part. If, he, if God tapped me on the shoulder, I'd turn around and actually saw him standing there. And he told me, you know what, the Bible's true, Benji. You oh, sure I would. If I actually saw him there. Absolutely. But why doesn't he do that? And, the, and the, the explanation I'm always given is because that that would make it too easy for me. That would make the choice too simple. Right? I wouldn't be my true self if he did that. If God were sitting in my living room telling me what to do all the time, and I could see him apparently, you know, just sitting there, I wouldn't be my true self. But this contradicts the reason why I need to get saved. The idea that, I, that the, the path to salvation is based on belief. So he, so he doesn't want me to believe him on one hand, and he wants me to believe him on the other hand. That's a contradiction. It's incoherent. Hello.